What's up guys, in this video, you're gonna learn how to create a Docker image for your Java application. I have here a jar file, which is actually a Spring Boot application, and we're gonna take that and we're gonna Dockerize it. We're gonna have our Spring Boot application running on Docker, okay? Now, in order to do that, we have to build what's called a Docker image. Now, to build a Docker image, you need a Docker file. All right, so let's go through the easy steps on how to create a Docker file or how to containerize our Java application through the Docker file. So first off, let's VI this Docker file. And you'll see there's not much in here, right? And that's the whole point of the video. It's a very simple, methodical way on how to, you know, have your Java application that's on your host machine run in a Docker container. Now the first step, right? In total, there's six steps. Four of them are gonna be in the Docker file and the rest are gonna be basically then building and running your application, right? In a Docker container. So the first one is to create a base image. To create a base image, you need the Docker file from command. Now this raises the question, what is a Docker base image? It's just somebody else's image, right? Somebody else, actually created a Docker image and you're accessing it so you can build upon your own configurations, right? So think of it as a parent image, if you will. Now these images are stored in some repository. And if you take a look here at Docker Hub, I got this one right here. So before we even go to Docker Hub though, let's answer some very fundamental questions on how to pick a perfect base image. You're going to have to figure out what environment, what platform your Java application runs in. Is it running it on Windows? Is it running on Linux? And that's the first question you got to answer. After that, what uh, flavor of that platform are you using? What distribution? If you're using Linux like I am right here, are you using CentOS? Are you using Debian? Are you using Ubuntu? Are you using Alpine? You got to answer that. We're going to be using Alpine in this case, okay? Then after that, you're gonna have to figure out, well, am I using a JRE, right? Am I using a JDK? Because JREs are smaller, they're more lightweight, they don't have all the extra you know, compiling and all that stuff than a JRE. In this case, I'm just running the application, so I don't need a JDK, right? So that answers that question. Then, what version do I want? Do I want version 11, 13, all that kind of stuff? You need to answer that. I chose 13. And then you need to figure out, do you want an open license? Do you want a paid license like an Oracle? So all those questions are going to drive you to pick the perfect image that somebody else, right, has already constructed for us. Now in this case here, once I've answered all that and I read a whole bunch of documentation on what kind of was the best JDK distribution that was open source and all that, I came across Azul Systems, which is very reputable, and they have a whole bunch of distributions, one of them being Alpine, okay? Now, if I go over to the tag section, you'll notice there's a whole bunch of binary distributions of the OpenJDK, anything from the latest, which you know, uh, you'd have to go take a look what the latest is in this case, you'd have to click on it, but you can see that these tags clearly tell you what the, la what the version is. So 11, for example, you got some more specific ones, but take a look here. This hash uniquely identifies, and you'll notice that the hashes are all the same for those three. And if you click on the tag itself, you can see what actually went into building this specific base image, okay? So let me just go back here, and you'll notice that the JRE, or version 13 JRE is over here, and that's what I picked, and you'll notice it's only 63.73 um, meg, as opposed to, let's say, the JDK for 14 which is much, much bigger, right? So always make sure you try to build the smallest, leanest possible um, you know, images because later on that'll transcend to saving space on disk, you know, faster downloads, smaller attack surfaces, that kind of stuff. And you could pack more containers on a machine, right? So that is how I selected this tag over here. I combined this repository name specifying that and then I separated the tag name with a colon right now if you click on that uh, if you click on this tag over here it'll give you the full name that you just can copy paste into your your docker file if you want right on top over here okay and then again like I said you can see exactly what went into building that environment so that is very very important I can't overstate the first step you got to pick the right base image right based on the answers to those questions that I just went through 
That's step one. Step two is copying over, getting your, your, your Java application into the Docker image, right? So every instruction in this Docker file is going to create a new layer in the Docker image, okay? So in this case here, I'm copying over the jar file into the slash temp uh, directory inside the Docker's file system. Now, how does it know where to get it? Well, it's looking at the current working directory. So right now I have a couple of artifacts in the current working directory and best practice is to create an empty directory, copy everything you need in that directory, and then Docker will be able to find it because we're just going to point to it. Okay. Now that's the second step. Get your file in there. Now, should you create a jar file? Should you create a war file? Should you use copy? Should you use the other variant, which is add all those kind of questions? are answered in my blog post here. Okay, so if you take a look at that, you can take a look at what the difference between copy and add are, if you should use a war file or a jar file, all that kind of stuff. I wanna keep the video a little bit small or short in this case, right? So the third step is to provide any configuration that your Java application needs to run in that Docker container, right? Any, any configuration that you would have supplied to it on a normal machine, right, not, not running in a Docker environment, you would still need to supply in a Docker environment. So, for example, let's say you needed a configuration file that held some key value pairs, right? I would need to copy that configuration file, which again is in my current working directory, right, into the slash TMP um, file system onto the Docker container. Now, I could pick any you know, directory, I just picking slash TMP because I know it exists, right? Now my Java application might also be referencing an environmental variable in order to gain access to the location of that configuration file to open it up and read it. So in that case, the Docker file env command will allow you to specify the key as the config underscore file for an environment variable and the value would be the path to the configuration file. So if you would ever log into or exec into the docker container and execute an env command you would actually see this config underscore file environmental variable show up just like you would let's say the environmental variable path okay so that's the third step uh, optional if you need some configuration i included it there fourth step is launching your java application okay so we want to treat our docker container as a executable so the executable being this Java minus jar command. Now how to do that is to use the entry point command. So you can only have one of these. And there is a, a difference between entry point and using another command called CMD command. If you wanna know the differences between the two, again, go take a look at my blog and I go through the difference between command and entry point. But in this case, the best practice for us is going to be to treat our container as an executable. So we're going to use entry point, right? So every time somebody executes our container, it's going to act as if it's really this command over here, right? Now, an important note is that these three steps on the top here actually occur at build time. And this last step here is going to execute at runtime when we actually instantiate or run our Docker container, right? So this leads us to the fifth step. How do we actually build our Docker uh, image file, right? So you do that with the Docker build command. I might have this in the um, in the history here, at a, right? So we're gonna use Docker build. We're gonna tag, right? This could be minus minus tag as well. We're gonna tag this image. We're gonna call it my Docker Java app. And we're gonna give it a version number as a tag, version one, okay? If we didn't give it a version, it would versioned it as latest, okay? So I'm gonna say dot, and dot is the current working directory. If we take a look at, if we just do an ls here, you'll notice that the current working directory has the artifacts that we need. So it's gonna build a context out of this directory, and you're gonna see that it's going to build, it's gonna execute every command that we have in the Docker file. It's gonna create a layer for every single step, right? And it's going to build at the end of it a Docker image, which is called my Dockerized Java app version one, All right? So if I would grep this here, if I say Docker images, and I grep that, because I have a lot of stuff on my system, so I don't wanna show you everything, you'll get confused. You'll see this is the image name, the version number, that's the tag. You have an idea of the top level image 
digest hash that's created out of you know because there's all a bunch of image layers that are created this is the topmost one that's nothing that you need to really know about and this is the total size of it all right so now we have our docker image we started with a docker file we built it that's step five into a docker image now we're at the last step okay step six is actually running your docker container so how do we go about and do that let me just clear this console here we're going to say docker container run now what are we going to run we're going to we want to run that image that we just created right so in this case here look at all the images if i just say tab tab that we have obviously that's a whole bunch of stuff here so i'm just going to kind of say my dockerize application now again it's version one now what's going to happen if i run this it's obviously going to run but it's also going to then not remove the container after it's done so it's going to kind of i'm going to get garbage containers just lying around doing stuff right do actually doing nothing so i'm going to say minus minus rm i don't want the container to lie around and take up space on my my disk system on my file system um, so i want to remove it after i want to clean it up after so it's going to go it's going to execute you can see the Spring Boot logo show up and a whole bunch of output comes up that's specific to that tutorial that I came out with with the Java optionals, right? So I just executed a jar file, right, into a Docker environment. I dockerized a Java application into a Docker environment in those easy steps, right? So again, six steps. One, create a Docker file that has a base image copy your docker file in there provide configuration launch it then build it and then run it okay so there you have six easy steps on how to dockerize your java or in this case spring boot application in a docker environment and building the perfect docker image in order to recreate that inside any environment now i got a lot more to say about the subject so why don't you go check out the article on mvpjava.com and uh, until next time guys i'll be getting the next one ready take care